Well, what you're looking at there is the culprit of so much media attention about a year ago. That's the Juro spider. And we're talking this month with a scientist that studies things about that spider and getting a leg up or two or eight or so on those. That's Dr. Dave Coyle. Hey, Nick. Doc, it's so good to be with you again. Dr. Coyle is with Clemson University, Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation, and has joined us on Ranger Nick over the years. We appreciate you coming back and wanting to hang out with me a little more. Hey, man, appreciate the invite. I always like talking about this stuff. Well, thanks so much. And this is a little critter that I want to ask you some questions about. We're looking at a juvenile right now in front of us. This is the guy that in August, September, they're going to be that three inch long spider. Talk to me about right now, what's this guy doing in terms of survival? What's he feeding on? How did this guy get to this point where we are right now in Oconee County, Georgia? Yeah, Joro spiders have actually been in Northern Georgia since 2014. That was the first report is 2014. Okay. Their populations have grown and grown, but I tell you, really it was last year that the media picked up and there was all sorts of articles about giant ballooning spiders, right, and Joro spiders everywhere. Mm. I first saw them here in my yard in Oconee County in 2020. Okay. So it took a while for their populations to get big enough, but right now, these little spiders are just doing standard spider stuff. They're making webs. There's a bunch of them on this tree right now. They're catching anything that goes in there. They're wrapping it up. They're sucking the juices out of it and they're just surviving. They're getting bigger and bigger. Now, these are the guys that have those webs that literally are like a guitar string. I talk about, you can almost pluck that thing. Very, very powerful. So with a spider like this, talk to us about what we should be worried about, if anything, was something like this in our yard, because that was the attention it was getting last year. Yeah, it was getting a lot of attention. You know, what are these spiders gonna do? And I tell you, these spiders aren't really gonna do anything to people or pets. They don't have mandibles or jaws big enough to bite through skin. I've held them, you can hold them. They're super docile. They just wanna do their spider thing. They can be a nuisance. Yeah. for certain you know you'll see them they will make webs all over trees plants your house in front of doors so you know i just tell people treat them like you would treat any other nuisance thing mm. right if you've got a spider putting a web where it doesn't you don't want it move it okay. right just get rid of it take a broom and get that thing out of there uh, you need to move the actual spider if you just knock down the web it's going to build a, a web in that same space again i tried last year i knocked down a web in one spot three times in a row and it built the same thing back the next morning. They're, they're so, workaholics, they're aren't they? Work <laughs> so if you want to move these things, you got to get the spider and move it away and just relocate it somewhere. Interesting. Now, yeah. I want to talk about from the front porch standpoint of something like this, there's a certain stinging insect that might cause some issues for the Juro spider. And I want to go to the front porch with you next, Dave. So let's go there now. All right, so we've relocated to Dave's front porch, and a little bit ago, we just chiseled down one of those mud dauber nests up in the corner that maybe you have at your own home there. And Dave, if I'm a Juro spider, why should I be concerned about one of those mud daubers, those little wasps, and the potential to get into their nest? Yeah, if you're a Juro spider, you should be concerned. Mud daubers hunt spiders. So okay. they'll make these tubes of mud, and then they'll go paralyze spiders. We took a bunch out. They catch these little spiders, they paralyze them, they shove them up in that tube, and then they lay an egg on them. Holy and so egg. she'll cap off the end and basically make a series of little rooms full of paralyzed spiders that her, the egg will hatch, the larva will feed on it, and then it will emerge as a spider. So these mud daubers you see, the wasps with those really skinny waist, they're predators on spiders. And think about that, grabbing a hold of a spider, and this time of the year, as these drawers become more prevalent, this might be an opportunity for that mud dauber to grab one of those spiders. And if you take a look at some of these guys, these are likely not the drawers, Dave. What are we thinking here? Yeah, they don't look like Joros to me. They look like they might be another type of orb weaver, but I don't think they're Joros. The coloring's just a little bit wrong, and they look a little too big right mm. now to have been Joros. But this is about the size they like, so in another few weeks, uh, these things will probably, or the Joros will be large enough to, to be of good size. It's incredible they would grab those. So next time you're watching one of those mud daubers and worried about them stinging, you realize that they're taking care of those Joros mm -hmm. and some of the other spiders and feeding on them. Well, Dave, I want to wrap it up today with the idea of what can the folks at home do as they maybe encounter a Joros spider? How can they contribute some data to some of the studies you're doing? So let's go there next. 
Well, working with spiders is a family affair, isn't it? So Parker and Connor are Dave's boys, and they are joining me now, and they're both holding a juvenile Juro spider. And one of the things we're doing with this message is showing that these spiders are harmless. They're not here to hurt us, guys. Are they doing anything to you besides yeah. chilling out, huh? <laughs> Pretty cool. And I love your passion for wanting to help dad with this and be part of this. I love to see kids getting involved with this for the folks at home that might want to get involved and contribute some data to studies that you might be doing on these. Is there something that we can do to contribute information, maybe through the web <clears throat> to help you? <laughs> yeah, that good, good one there. Uh, there's a website called iNaturalist and iNaturalist.org. And the best thing we can ask people to do is report sightings of these. One of the biggest issues we have is we don't know exactly where they are. We depend on people to tell us if we've got one in your yard or, or where it goes. It helps us know where they are now and where they're going. Yeah. So if people would go to iNaturalist, it's completely free. You can just take a picture, it uploads in seconds. That would be extremely helpful and that'll help us figure out a lot about what these things are going to be doing to our environment. It's incredible, the distribution, the range, and that's something that kids and their teachers can even engage with in the classroom, too. So, Doc, thanks so much for today. Appreciate I so appreciate it, Nick. it. Guys, thanks so much for hanging out with me. Y'all know what to do while you're on the web, looking around. Check out the Ranger Nick Facebook page and see what we got going on there. And until next time, for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick, reminding you, as I always do, that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here again this time next month. See ya.